Hello everyone. I've finally managed to convince myself to get back on camera and um, I wanted to answer some of your questions about the Rosenberg, which I know you read a couple of weeks ago now, but is still um, important for your midterm, uh, which is coming up. So I wanted to um, address the main, at least the main uh, question I received um, so I received it a couple times from different people, which is about the difference between contamination and configuration view of disease causation. So when you look at um, medicine uh, before the development of bacteriology, uh, before the identification of bacteria, before laboratory science, what you had was an understanding of disease as a kind of imbalance in an overall system. Um, and you can see this through various systems, medical systems, including the humoral theory, um, among others, right? The idea that uh, disease was caused by bad air, what was called miasmas, um, or other ways of understanding the uh, effect of climate on the body or the effect of um, imbalances in the body on health uh, through, for example, you know, anger or... Um, the effect of what you ate, um, etc. So the configuration view of disease really saw disease or illness as the result of a kind of imbalance, as I said, between the, the, the in the environment of the organism uh, and in the relationship of the organism to its environment. Now, the contamination view uh, sees disease as the result of um, an infection or the result of the presence of a, contamina of a contaminant, right? That's why it's called the contamination view. Um, and this uh, really developed more after um, bacteriology was established or after laboratory medicine was developed. Because then it was able, because then, you know, through microscopes and other kinds of laboratory techniques, it was possible to identify specific pathogens, which were, you know, the causative agents of disease. So um, you can contrast these two theories of disease causation, and you can see how um, the contamination view is more tied to what we think of as modern medicine um, but as Rosenberg notes, these are actually complementary views of understanding disease are not necessarily in contradiction with each other. And we can still see the ways in which configuration plays a part in um, even in bacteriological analyses. Uh, and more and more uh, medicine and epidemiology are turning towards a kind of synthesis of um contamination and configuration because it's no longer really the case that, um, well, most scientists don't think uh, anymore that it's just about sort of finding the pathogen and killing the pathogen uh, and then everything is fine, but actually most people in involved in uh, medical research understand that there is a relationship between the environment and the pathogens that people come into contact with. So more and more, for example, through the uh, Merrill Singer's theory of ecosyndemics, you can see this clearly, that there's an understanding of the ways in which, yes, there is contamination, yes, there are pathological agents, yes, there's bacteria, viruses, etc., but the interactions between those um, organisms that exist or those pathogens that exist and the people that get sick have to do with the way that uh, people move through the environment. But it's also, you know, it, it is true that we don't, um, you know, medicine um, science doesn't really consider the, the theory of miasmas to have any validity anymore. So you don't really, hardly anyone thinks that they're going to get sick because they're exposed to, you know, bad air. Although we can still see um, in many ways the, that it continues to hold an influence, for example, when you're told... Um, you know, don't get wet, don't, don't get rained on or you'll get sick or don't go out in the, in the morning air or in the evening air because you'll get sick. So you'll, and uh, these are kind of like diffused notions of, um, environmental, uh, 
uh, imbalance or the ways in which the configuration of your environment can affect your health. And they're not necessarily completely wrong, but they're also not completely right. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so this, there's some tension between these two modes of understanding disease causation, but they're also complementary in many ways. Um, let's see what else is here. Um, uh, contingent contagion. Yeah, the contingent contagion, the notion of contingent contagion has to do with that synthesis between the configuration and the contamination view, uh, because not everyone who's exposed to a disease a pathogen become sick even with uh, the coronavirus the novel coronavirus not everybody who comes into contact with it gets sick and not all for example not all healthcare providers who come into contact with it get sick and and the reason for that is you know somewhat a question of chance somewhat a question of whether people have access to protective equipment and how well they use it uh, but it also has to do with the um, the immune system of the healthcare provider or of the person who's exposed. And, and the immune system is a very complicated system that um, has a lot to do with not only your own experiences throughout your life and how they've shaped you, but also even those of your ancestors. And, and we know, for example, that much of the immunological information that our immune systems have when we're young, uh, when we're young children comes from our mothers, comes from uh, the mother's milk. And so um, actually breastfeeding is a really important part of building the immune system for children because there's so much immunological information that gets passed down through the, through the breast milk. So, um, so even that can have an influence on whether people get sick, you know, 30, 40, 50 years later when they're confronted with a pathogen. So, um, so yeah, so again, that, that question of like how the environment of an organism or of a disease um, affects the ways in which it plays out. Um, the question of a modern and a postmodern um, epidemic is, is kind of a, you know, the Rosenberg just thinking a little bit through the question of history and how we think about disease in relationship to theories of history. Um, if we think about a modern theory of disease, we're really thinking about uh, a very kind of, uh, you know, straightforward notion of disease or like this disease agent comes into contact with this host and, and then there's disease. But in the way that, that um, Rosenberg is trying to think through it, uh, trying to think about AIDS as a postmodern disease um, and is through these tropes of reflexivity um, and detachment and sort of um, fractional or fractured um, experience because AIDS did not affect everyone the same um, and it created these kind of pockets of uh, infection, which were uh, treated differently uh, depending on the, the sort of purported moral worth of the people who were infected. Um, and so in order to understand how AIDS played out and continues to play out, you have to have an understanding of history that goes beyond those kind of meta narratives uh, of science and of reason as the absolute uh, sort of guiding, guiding logic of uh, medicine. Uh, because, you know, what, what we see in response to HIV AIDS was actually a very complicated node of uh, religion, homophobia, racism, um, denial, uh, blame, um, and uh, kind of, you know, religious fundamentalism. Uh, so, it's it's hard to it's hard to explain completely uh, in this brief time what Rosenberg is trying to do there, but he's basically just working with different approaches to studying history, and thinking about diseases that emerge in different points in history. And HIV/AIDS emerged in the '80s at the same time as postmodernism, as a kind of cultural theory emerged, and so he's trying to read AIDS 
through the, the, the cultural paradigm that emerged concurrently with AIDS at the same time as AIDS. Um, yeah, in uh, the, the Avani asked um, why quarantine is referred to as an institution. Quarantine is an institution in the same way that the family is an institution. Institutions are not just, you know, um, schools, banks, um, institutions in that kind of very solid, large uh, social institution, <laughs> forgive the redundance, uh, kind of way. But institutions can also be kind of um, solidified forms of social action. And, uh, oh, that was a good phrase, solidified forms of social action. Yeah, so the family can be thought of as one of those. You can think of as quarantine as a, as a as an institution. You could think of, for example, to give you another example, uh, coming out, the idea of coming out as a kind of institution. Um, so, yeah, it's just a different sort of meaning or a different uh, application of that word institution. Um and uh, you asked, Avni also asked about larger frameworks of meaning, where Rosenberg says the implacable circumstantiality of an epidemic coexists with, uh, in fact, necessarily invokes larger frameworks of meaning. And she asked, what does this mean? So every epidemic is circumstantial. It's very specific. It emerges in a specific place. It has a specific pathogen and interacts with the population in a particular kind of way. Um, and so it's very specific. It's, you know, dependently arisen, as the Buddhists say. Uh, it comes out of the circumstances of a specific place and time. And yet it always evokes this kind of uh, larger framework of meaning because it, it immediately puts us before the question of our own mortality. And not just individual mortality, but social mortality is sort of uh, the, the question becomes not just, you know, what is life or what's the point of life or or how can I make meaning of life, but the broader questions about, um, you know, what is what is social meaning? What does it mean to be a human? What does it mean to be a society? And what are the boundaries of that society? Who is inside or outside of that society? Uh, what are the existential threats to that society? What happens if a particular culture, for example, is wiped out? as we see uh happened and uh continues to threaten to threaten uh, to be possible that diseases could wipe out entire indigenous cultures uh or the last remaining uh folks who hold linguistic skills or cultural knowledge uh from indigenous cultures so in that sense the even though each epidemic is very individual and particular it also brings up these broader uh, frameworks of meaning um, and and like in the Camus book uh, the novel they bring up these very existential questions about um, life the meaning of life the meaning of being etc okay um, and uh, Avni also asked about a, a particular society constructs its characteristic response to the epidemic does that mean there are culture-specific responses to epidemics? Yes, absolutely. There are culture-specific responses to epidemics. Not every culture responds to epidemics the same way. Um, and uh, the universal response in this case has been quarantine. Sure, but quarantine means different things in different places to different people, right? Uh, quarantine, even here in the States, means something different for people who are considered essential workers and have to go out. Uh, to their jobs in supermarkets or other uh, or gas stations or uh, or hospitals um, and and they're still in a sense quarantined but not in the same way as those of us who are um, not leaving our house to go to work for example uh, likewise in other parts of the world where people depend on a daily wage um, or in play or uh, communities here in the United States, um, wherever that people de depend on a daily wage, they can't afford to quarantine entirely. So, you know, what does quarantine mean? Uh, culture is culturally specific. Um, uh, there are some similarities, of course, but they are different. But, but beyond quarantine, I think it's really important uh, what you said about their cultural, sp culture specific responses to epidemics. Absolutely. Yes. 
Um, and that has to do with the ways that different cultures think about the body, think about disease, think about death, funerary rites, um, um, you know, how people deal with the dead. Um, these are all very different uh, across different cultures and they have different implications for the ways that epidemics are dealt with. Um, Sila asked a question about, um, a, uh, she said, from the second reading, AIDS remind us of the difficulty of inducing changes in behavior and thus of the intrinsic complexity of the decisions facing local governments and public health authorities. Uh, reminds me of the townspeople and the plague and the protesters in Lansing. People really do not like having their lives disrupted by epidemics and they prefer to blame victims and be outraged at the government. Um, yes, that's right. It, it is very difficult for people to accept that they are not able to go on living their lives in the ways that they're accustomed to. Um, and it is very difficult to change behavior. So you know, in the last week or two, we've seen a couple of examples of people behaving violently when they're asked to use face masks in stores. And I'm sure you've heard about the poor security guard in Lansing that was shot for asking a woman to cover her face or to wear a face mask. There was also a report from a store in which a man used the employee's, an employee's sleeve to clear, to like wipe his nose because she asked him to wear a mask. And so you, you would think that this would be like a reasonable thing to ask someone just wear a mask. Uh, but people are so um, people take that personally in such a way that it means that they're not willing to change their behavior. With, with, with regards to HIV AIDS specifically, um, the challenges there the, in terms of prevention had to do with um, with very specific behavioral changes that were uh, attempted such as, for example, using condoms and getting people to wear condoms when they have sex or what we what we call safer sex. And, and um, that push has been pulled back somewhat. I mean, you still get people talking about safe sex and using condoms. And, and I hope that you all use condoms or latex barriers to protect yourselves when you're having um, sex, especially with folks that you're not monogamous with. But... Um, at the same time, the reason why those uh, messages have been pulled back somewhat is because 30 years, 35 years of AIDS prevention showed that it just doesn't work. Like people are not going to use condoms most of the time. Uh, most people are not going to use condoms in a cons on a consistent basis. Um, and that has to do with a lot of factors. It has to do with vulnerability uh, and who they feel they can say yes or no to with regards to sex, with regards to latex barriers. It has to do with access to information. It has to do with access to the the products themselves, being able to purchase them, being able to acquire them, being able to negotiate them with a partner. Um, and some people just refuse to use them altogether because they don't like how they feel or because they feel somehow defiled by them or they feel that it shows a lack of trust with their partner. So it has been very difficult to get people to change their sexual behavior Um and uh, so that is one of the ways in which I think Rosenberg is talking here about um, how complex the decisions in terms of uh, the public health with relate, uh, relating to HIV AIDS because of the, the basically, and we see that here again now with COVID-19, we don't have a, a cure, we don't have a vaccine, and so what we have are kind of behavior modification uh, techniques that can improve uh, one's chances of, of not getting it or can or can improve prevention. Uh, but this is very difficult to accomplish on a mass scale. Um, and last, uh, Owen said uh, that he thought the readings were powerful and that they simultaneously allow for an overall transfer transformation of human perspective an acknowledgement of what has remained constant and the multifarious interactions of transformation and constancy in the present moment um, and making space for both dignity and disaster in the perspectival landscapes of tradition and modernity. Yeah, not that the two are ever so separate. That's right. Uh, so yes, I hope that you enjoyed reading the Rosenberg. I have a um, an image that I want to share with you. I'll see if I can put it at the end of this video.
uh, that comes from a presentation of COVID-19 that actually also shows uh, the stages of development of the disease. If I can't put it on the video, I'll just put it uh, uh, with the video on the blog post. And, um, and I would like you to look at that and sort of compare it to that three act, or if you had, you know, my analysis of Rosenberg four act, um, sort of progression of epidemics. So I'm going to stop here and thanks everybody for your comments and questions.